You could argue, I suppose, that I was never the one in the spotlight or the first pick. That was my older sister, Hannah. She had it all from the beginning. Gifts, attention, everything. I'm Emily, and this is my childhood narrative. Our home seemed respectable enough. Mom was a part-time clerk, and Dad was a mechanic. Even though they weren't making a lot of money, Anna always had plenty. Me, the leftovers were given to me. We were seated around the little dinner table one chilly December evening, which essentially determined the course of my early years. Anna was talking endlessly about a school assignment that she had aced. When Anna responded, my teacher said it was the best in the class. Her eyes glowed so brightly that my parents literally glowed with delight. My daughter is like that. With pleasure in his voice, Dad continued, we knew those science kits were worth every penny. Mom gave a nod. We'll get you whatever you need. Honey, you just keep up the good work. I felt the same knot in my gut as I prodded at my meal. I said, hey, I got an A on my maths test. Not sure why I had bothered. Mom responded, that's nice, Emily, with hardly a sidelong glance at me. Make sure you keep it up. Not a word of praise. No thrill. It seemed as though I was expected to score highly or worse as though it made no difference. I was taught early on not to have high expectations. With Christmas just a few weeks away, the difference in our living room was nearly comical. Beautifully wrapped presents stacked up under the tree, all for Anna. I was familiar with the pattern. Typically, I would give socks or books as presents. There was nothing particularly special. It was no different that year. With delight, Anna tore through her gifts, finding new laptops, devices, and clothing. This is amazing, my God. Thank you, Dad and Mom, she said. I opened mine, a pack of plain shirts and a used book. Thanks, I responded, attempting to hide my dismay. After the holidays ended, everything resumed their regular schedule. I was only there, and Anna was the star. The only person who appeared to notice was Aunt Sarah. She occasionally stopped by, usually bringing a tiny present that was specifically for me and gave me a sense of recognition. However, following a particularly unpleasant dispute, such visits ceased. I heard them in the kitchen on my way home from school. John, you must stop doing this. With a harsh and irritated tone, Aunt Sarah said, you're neglecting your younger daughter. Sarah, she doesn't need as much as Anna. Dad shot back in a stern voice. That isn't the purpose. It's about demonstrating your concern for both of your girls. Dad said, well, maybe if Emily was more like her sister, it wouldn't be so hard, unbeknownst to me. Aunt Sarah was the first to see me, and when she spotted me, her face fell. Before I could hear any more, I hurried up to my room. Tears are burning against my cheeks. Aunt Sarah was no longer permitted to visit after that. According to Dad, she was creating unnecessary fuss and causing difficulty. However, it was real. Every day I lived it. It was like standing on a precipice after high school. With a large check from her parents to cover her room, books, and other expenses. Anna was heading off to college. Me. They congratulated me and said, good luck, Emily. Shortly after that, I moved out. Mom watched, her expression emotionless, while I packed my meager belongings into old boxes and luggage. There was no drama, no tearful farewells. A little residence on the outskirts of town caught my eye. It was a beginning, but not much. Jen and Lisa, Two other females who shared the house had as huge of goals as I had but were nearly as broke. The day I moved in, Lisa jokingly said, Welcome to the dungeon, and left as she showed me around the little room. But we managed to make it work. You have a job lined up, right? I said, starting at the diner tomorrow, 
and threw a box that would belong to me on the bed, and maybe something at the bookstore part-time. Good hustle, Jen said, nodding with approval in her eyes. On the first, we all contribute to the rent. Please, no exceptions. I told her, got it, having already mentally calculated my hours and costs. It was difficult to work two jobs. I was always on my feet at the diner, taking orders, avoiding the Irish cook, and grinning the entire while. I worked at the bookshop on nights and evenings, ringing up sales and shelving books. The quiet was a sharp contrast to the diner mayhem. Saving for college seemed like chasing a phantom as the months stretched into a year. Something would come up right after I had set away a small amount. Similar to when I became ill, it came as a surprise to me. I was oak one day, then the next I was so hot that I could hardly move from my bed. That's how Lisa discovered me, shivering behind a stack of blankets. She said, Jesus M., you look like hell, with a worried expression on her face. You need a doctor. I murmured, I can't afford a doctor, as the room began to spin. We'll figure it out, she insisted, pulling out her phone. There's a clinic. They charge based on what you earn. Don't be stubborn about this. The clinic was a crowded, weary place where the wait times could break you if the illness didn't. When my turn finally came, the doctor was a kind, tired-looking man who prescribed some meds and plenty of rest. You need to take it easy, he advised, handing me a prescription. Can you take some time off work? I almost laughed. Not really, but I'll see what I can do. Back at the apartment, I crunched the numbers. Meds, missed shifts, just scraping by on rent. It all added up too fast. My college fund, the little there was, dwindled to nothing after the medical ordeal and draining my savings. I knew I had to face it. I needed help. Swallowing my pride, I decided to call home. It had been a while since we talked, not properly since I moved out. The phone rang and I braced myself. Mom, it's Emily. Emily, this is unexpected. Everything okay? Her voice was cautious, not warm or worried. I need to ask a favor. Can I come home for a bit? Just till I get back on my feet? My voice sounded small, even to my own ears. There was a pause, the kind that tells you the answer won't be what you want to hear. Oh, Emily, you know your sister just moved back in with her husband. They're using your old room. There's really no space. My heart sank, but I pushed on. Can't we figure something out? Maybe I could sleep on the couch. It's just, just for a little while. There was another long pause. I'm sorry, Emily. It's just not possible right now. Maybe when things settle down with Anna and the baby. I hung up and sat there, the silence of the apartment pressing down on me. They had made their choice, and I wasn't it. I was on my own, truly on my own. The next few days were a blur of applying for any job I could find, skipping meals to save a few bucks and trying not to think about the fact that my own family had turned me away when I needed them the most. It was during one of my late-night job searches that I got a call from Aunt Sarah. Emily, sweetheart, I heard about what happened. Are you okay? Her voice was like a lifeline. Hey, Aunt Sarah, I'm managing, just trying to figure things out. Listen, why don't you come stay with me for a while? You shouldn't be alone through this. I felt tears prick at my eyes, relief washing over me. Really? Are you sure? I don't want to impose. Of course I'm sure. You're not imposing. Your family, more than just when it's convenient. Pack your things and come over. We'll sort the rest out together. Thank you, Aunt Sarah. Thank you so much. I said, my voice thick with emotion. Packing up my things again, I couldn't help but feel the weight of the rejection, but also the warmth of being welcomed without conditions. Odd Sarah's place wasn't big, but it was filled with love.
something that had been sorely missing for too long. When I arrived, Aunt Sarah was waiting at the door. She wrapped me in a big hug as soon as I stepped out of the cab. You're home now, Emily. Let's not worry about anything else tonight, she said, ushering me inside. Life at Aunt Sarah's was different from anything I'd known. It was quiet, peaceful, and most importantly, I felt wanted. A few days after I moved in, Aunt Sarah and I sat down at her old, scarred kitchen table for some real talk. The morning sun spilled over the cluttered surface, turning the steam from our coffee cups into golden swirls. So, Emily, what's the plan? Aunt Sarah asked, her eyes locking onto mine with that direct, no-nonsense way she had. I took a deep breath, stirring my coffee slowly. Honestly, Aunt Sarah, I want to go to college. I want to be a lawyer, but everything's just messed up right now. She nodded, tapping a finger on the table. Thoughtful, lawyer, huh? That's a big dream, Emily. Big dreams are good. They keep us going, but they need big plans. What's stopping you? Money, I said flatly. Money is stopping me, and I've been working jobs, but it's never enough, especially not for law school. Aunt Sarah leaned back, her chair creaking slightly under the shift. I might have a solution for that, but it comes with a condition. I frowned, curious and a bit wary. What kind of condition? You get into college, and I'll pay for it. But Emily, you've got to commit. No half measures. You work your tail off, you study hard, and you pass everything. Not just pass Excel. Can you do that? Her offer floored me. It was more than I could have hoped for. Yes, I can do that. I will. Thank you, Aunt Sarah. With that, we started planning. I applied to colleges that offered good law programs, crafting application letters late into the night. When the acceptance letter from a well-respected state college came, I actually pinched myself, thinking I was dreaming. I did it, Aunt Sarah. I got in. College was tough. Law school, even tougher. Aunt Sarah's financial support freed me from the constant stress of money, but it put another kind of pressure on me, the pressure to succeed. Not just for myself, but for her too. As semesters passed, I not only met Aunt Sarah's expectations, I exceeded them. My grades were top of the class. I landed an internship at a local law firm. One evening, after a particularly grueling day at the firm, I came home to find Aunt Sarah in the kitchen. Her expression was more serious than usual. Sit down, Emily. We need to talk. Worry pricked at my heart as I took a seat, noticing she wasn't her usual self. What's wrong, Aunt Sarah? I asked. She sighed a long, heavy sigh. Nothing's wrong exactly. I just want you to know how proud I am of you. You've done more than I ever expected. You're going to be a great lawyer. Her praise warmed me, but her tone hinted at something unsaid. Thanks, Aunt Sarah. I couldn't have done it without you. That's not just it, she continued, her eyes serious. You've got to start thinking about what comes next. You're about to fly, and I'm just glad I could give you the wings. During my final year of law school, I managed to secure a prestigious internship at a respected law firm downtown. The first day, I walked into the towering building, feeling like I was exactly where I was supposed to be. My supervisor, a sharp-tongued lawyer named Mr. Coleman, met me at his office door with a skeptical look. So you're the intern I've heard so much about. Emily, right. Mr. Coleman's voice was gruff, his eyes scanning me like I was a case file he wasn't sure about. Yes, sir. I'm here to learn and contribute as much as I can. I replied, my voice steady despite the butterflies dancing in my stomach. The work was intense. I spent days buried in legal research, drafting documents, and sometimes I was allowed to sit in on client meetings, observing the real dance of law. 
Mr. Coleman didn't hand out praise easily, but when he did, it stuck. One late evening, after everyone else had gone home, I was still at my desk, poring over a particularly tough case. When Mr. Coleman walked by, he stopped, looking over my shoulder at the piles of legal journals and notes spread out in front of me. Don't you ever go home, Emily? He asked, an eyebrow raised in amusement, or maybe respect. I couldn't tell which. Not until I figure this out, I answered without looking up. This case could set a precedent, and I think there's an angle we've missed. Mr. Coleman grunted, pulling up a chair. Show me. We spent the next hour discussing the case back and forth, with me arguing my point based on a precedent I found that could help our client. Finally, he leaned back, rubbing his chin thoughtfully. Not bad, Emily. Not bad at all. You've got a sharp mind for this. Keep it up, and you'll make a fine lawyer. The day I graduated, I felt a mix of pride and nostalgia. Aunt Sarah was in the front row, clapping louder than anyone else, her eyes shining with tears. After the ceremony, as we walked out of the auditorium, she hugged me tight. You've done it, Emily. All those years of hard work, and here you are, she said, pulling back to look at me with that proud, unwavering support that had become my rock. I couldn't have done it without you, Aunt Sarah. You believed in me when no one else did, not even myself, I said, my own eyes misty. With my law degree in hand, I started applying for jobs. The market was competitive, brutal even, but I was not deterred. I sent out dozens of applications, went on several nerve-wracking interviews, and finally I got a call that would start the next chapter of my life. Miss Emily, this is Jared from Mason & Associates. I'm pleased to inform you that we'd like to offer you the position. Your internship performance was highly recommended by Mr. Coleman, and we believe you'd be a great fit. I almost dropped the phone. Thank you, Jared. I'd be honored to accept. When Aunt Sarah told me my sister Anna had never graduated college due to her early pregnancy and quick marriage, I wasn't really surprised. Aunt Sarah's health took a turn for the worse not long after that revelation. I was at work, buried in files, when I got the call from the hospital. My world stopped. I barely remember grabbing my things and rushing out. Everything after that was a blur until I reached her side. She was weak, her voice barely a whisper, but her eyes were the same, sharp and knowing. Emily, she murmured as I took her hand, trying to swallow the lump in my throat. I'm here, Aunt Sarah. I'm right here, I managed to say, my voice trembling. She squeezed my hand, her grip frail but firm. You did good, kid. I'm so proud of you. You remember what I always told you, to be strong, to stand up for yourself. I replied, the tears I had been holding back now streaming down my face. That's right, and you have, she said, her voice growing fainter. I've left you something in my will, the house. It's yours now. I nodded, unable to speak, squeezing her hand. We didn't say much after that. We didn't need to. Later that night, she passed away quietly in her sleep. The months following her death were a blur of legal matters and settling into the house that was now legally mine. I transformed it into something that felt like a real home for the first time in my life. Then out of the blue, my parents and Anna, with her husband and kids, decided to visit. I should have known they weren't just coming to check on how I was holding up. As soon as Anna walked in, she started inspecting the place like she was at an open house, commenting on every piece of furniture and layout. Oh, this would be perfect for the kids, she said loudly. Look at all the space, Mom. Her husband nodded, adding, yeah, we could really spread out here. I clenched my fists, trying to keep my cool. It wasn't until my mother chimed in that I lost it. Emily, you should really think about letting Anna have the house. They need the space, 
what with the kids and all. You can manage fine in a smaller place, can't you? I stared at them, disbelief turning quickly into anger. Are you serious? This is my house. Aunt Sarah left it to me, not to Anna. I'm not going anywhere. Anna, who had been pretty quiet, finally piped up, her voice dripping with entitlement. But you don't need all the space, Emily. It's just you here. We're a family of five. It just makes sense for us to have it. That's when I laughed. It wasn't because anything was funny, but because the sheer audacity of their request was absurd. You think just because you have kids and a husband, I have to give up my home. That's not how this works. Mom looked shocked. Emily, don't be greedy. Think of the family. Family. I scoffed, the word bitter in my mouth. Where was this family when I needed a place to stay? When I needed help? They didn't have an answer to that. Look, I said, my voice firm as I stood up taller. I appreciate you all coming here, but this house is mine. Aunt Sarah wanted me to have it, and I'm going to honor her wish. You need to leave now. Anna's husband tried to argue, his face turning red, but I didn't let him get far. Out. All of you. Now, or I'll call the police. They muttered about me being ungrateful and greedy as they gathered their things. Anna shot me a look that could freeze lava, her disappointment clear. But as they left, the weight on my shoulders lifted. I had stood up for myself, for my home, and for Aunt Sarah's memory. I came home from work to the most absurd situation. I couldn't get into my own house. The locks had been changed. Before I could process what was happening, I heard noises inside and started banging on the door. It swung open, and there stood my sister Anna with her husband, and their kids scattered behind her. We decided to move in here, she declared with a smug look, as if it was the most natural decision in the world. What are you talking about? This is my house. I snapped, disbelief and anger swirling inside me. Anna shrugged, unbothered. Well, we need it more than you do. We've already moved everything in. That's not how any of this works, Anna. I'm calling the police, I said, fumbling for my phone. She laughed, clearly thinking I was bluffing. Sure, go ahead. I dialed 911. Molly waited. Our parents showed up, drawn by the commotion. They sided with Anna, of course. Emily, why are you being so difficult? This is family. We should stick together, Mom said, her voice high-pitched and nervous. Dad, tell her, Anna added, turning to our father, who just frowned at me. This is just plain wrong, and you know it. I shot back the reality of the situation making my hand shake with rage. Anna's husband, who'd been silent until then, stepped up. Just drop it, Emily. Otherwise, you'll regret it, he sneered, his tone menacing. I started recording on my phone, aiming it at him. Threaten me again, and it's on record. He lunged for the phone, but I sidestepped him. Right then, the police arrived. It didn't take long for them to assess the situation. My sister was crying now, her kids confused and scared. Anna's husband kept saying, it's just a family matter, trying to downplay his earlier aggression. Mom was sobbing by now, pleading with the officers. Please, they're just kids. They don't understand. We're her family. I took a deep breath before I explained to the police. They broke in and changed the locks. I didn't give them permission. This is my house. The officers were firm. Breaking into a house and changing the locks is illegal, even if you are family, one of them told Anna and her husband. Finally realizing the seriousness of the situation, my family's bluster faded. The police made it clear they had to leave. They collected their belongings reluctantly and with many angry looks directed at me. 
I made sure no one else had the keys when I phoned the locksmith to replace the locks once again after the cops had departed. The echoes of the encounter filled the heavy quiet as I stood in the threshold of my recovered sanctuary. I first met Mike a few months later. I met him at a small event. He was a friend of a friend. I liked Mike's direct approach and found him to be easy to talk to. So you've had quite the year, huh? Mike smiled knowingly as he handed me a drink. I said, you could say that, with a half smile tipping up the corner of my lips. It's been eventful. We discussed everything and nothing throughout the evening, including literature, music, and our mutual dislike of soggy French fries. Speaking with someone who didn't view me as the forgotten sister or the lady who evicted her family was energizing. As the weeks stretched into months, Mike began to visit more frequently. Mike turned to face me one calm evening when we were sitting there enjoying a bowl of popcorn and watching a movie. He said, Emily, I've been thinking, and he paused the film. Yeah, my heart skipped a beat as I answered. I think what we have is great. He stated in a kind tone, I know your home is your haven, but I was wondering if you'd be okay with me being a more permanent part of it. I actually looked at him, and in his earnest, optimistic eyes, I saw all I needed. I just responded, I'd like that, and the room brightened with a smile. Although everything didn't become perfect right away, having Mike in my life made it much easier. We had other difficulties, such as when Anna attempted to cause difficulty once more by circulating false information about my lack of compassion. However, I wasn't alone when I faced it this time. Mike remarked, let them talk. One evening after I received a difficult phone from mom expressing Anna's distress. You are well known to those who know you. They are aware of the reality. That is the only thing that counts. He was correct, and I gradually started to let go of my bitterness and rage. Holding on to it was not worth it. Rather, I concentrated on the positive. The house I was creating, the walls I was erecting around myself, and the emotional barriers I was letting down. 